When you walked in today and you sat down, did you say hi to the person next to you? Did you ask them how they were? I imagine for many of you, the answer is probably no. In today's day and age, approaching a stranger and saying hi to them can feel a little bit like asking them for their firstborn child. And I felt that. And that's why, as my senior project, I decided to set a goal for myself. Before I left high school, I wanted to talk to every single person in my high school community. Teachers, students, kitchen staff, everyone. I ended up having 237 conversations, 15 minutes each. And here's why I did it, and here's what I learned. You see, we don't talk to strangers. We live in times characterized by an obsession with instant gratification, plotting our next steps, connecting often online. And look, I'm not here to hate on social media. I love social media as, next, as, as much as the next person. The connections that I formed on the internet online have benefited me so profoundly and have benefited society so profoundly. But there is something to be said about the fact that there are people that I follow on Instagram, Snapchat, etc., and I learn intimate details about their life, basically everything. And I see those same people in town, some of them, where I live, and I see them in person, and I want to ask them, how were those red velvet pancakes you had 2.75 hours ago? But instead, I keep walking, as if I don't know them. I don't even say hi, because there's a whole category for many of us of friends that are only for social media. It's fine to know their secrets, their truths, their performative selves, but it's not cool, it's uncomfortable, it's awkward to approach them in person to say hi. How are you? And while I think that this lack of conversation, this, this uncomfortableness has stemmed in part from the rise of the digital age, I think it's part of something larger, political phenomena, cultural phenomena. We live in times characterized by polarization. I don't need to name names of candidates, of parties, of movements for you to know that all around the world, we are seeing the rise of ideologies that seek to divide. We are seeing the propagation of narratives that use us versus them for the political agenda and gain of a few, but pit good people against one another. But you see, the thing is, us versus them only works, is only legitimate when the us and the them are separable. But what if we start asking them how they are, who they are? If we see the light illuminate in their eyes and the fire in their stomach ignite and we feel their humanity, I feel that soon the them starts feeling a lot more like the us. And isn't that what we need these days, to feel a little bit more like us? So why aren't we doing that? Why are the us and the them so separable? Because we live in these things called silos, bubbles, if you will, echo chambers. So much so to the extent that some are calling the times that we're living in post-truth. What does that even mean, post-truth? That we're so siloed, so deeply entrenched in our desperate realities, that when anyone says something within our silo, within our bubble, we agree with it. But from other bubbles, that's fake news, alternative facts, and maybe that's funny, but it's not. Because we're not talking to each other. We're pitting ourselves against each other. And how can we thrive if that's the case? This past fall, I laid on the floor of my room and I wept. As I realized that ideology, that parties, that candidates were winning, People were voting and succeeding who didn't want me alive. My name is Ziad Ahmed, Ahmed. 
I'm an 18-year-old progressive activist student from Princeton, New Jersey. I'm American Muslim, and I'm unapologetic about it. And for that, whether it's how I pray, the fact that I'm fasting right now and that's my worship, the fact that it's my last name, whatever it might be, what I believe, who I vote for, there are people who don't want me to exist, don't want me to thrive. There are people who will actively do things to prevent me from thriving. And I cried as I realized that those people, there were a lot of them. And that's a hard thing to swallow. But I realized I didn't hate them all. I was angry, sure. But how could I blame someone in a bubble, whether it's your West Virginian coal miner, your Daily Mail reader, whoever it might be? How can I blame them for not knowing me in the same way that I don't know them? You see, I've just painted them with a broad brush. I evoked an image of a West Virginian coal miner, a Daily Mail reader, and assumed their political ideology. I assumed what they might think of me the same way that they might paint me with a broad brush because of my name, because of where I live, because of how I practice. Because we're so entrenched in these bubbles. So as I realized this and grappled with the gravity of the question, where do I even start having these conversations? What we're seeing is that disagreement, challenging opinions, discourse is happening in Facebook comment threads, Twitter wars. Where are we challenging each other, really engaging in productive dialogue in person? I'm not here to say we all need to sit around in a circle and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. I'm not here for that. We should be disagreeing with one another. There are things that I believe and I will stand up for and I will defend them. But I shouldn't just be echoing them to people who already agree with me. I should be bringing my idea worth spreading and my idea worth spreading is that how can I call myself an activist? How can I stand for humanity if I haven't burst my bubble? How can I advocate for a community if I don't know my community? How can I advocate for equality if I myself am buying into us versus them narratives? So as I asked myself these questions, I realized I needed to start smaller. So I decided to start with my high school. And for me, that was possible. And I want to ground this conversation in the fact that it was possible for me because of my intersecting privileges. I go to a small school. It was possible for me. My intersecting privileges allowed it for me that I was never unsafe in my conversations. Those two things alone, that is not true for the majority of people around the world. So I recognize that. For me, it was my high school, but for you, it can be your homeroom, your knitting circle, your old friends that you made on Club Penguin, I don't care. But it has to be someone, that person next to you. We have to be looking each other in the eye and asking each other how we are, who we are. You see, I shouldn't have to remind you again that high school sucks for a lot of us. It's a time that many of us would, we would categorize as being a time of misunderstanding, of development, sure, and a lot of my fondest memories. I just graduated high school, so granted, a lot of my fondest memories are from high school. But I think that's true for a lot of people. It's a time when we ask ourselves, do I belong? Am I worth it? Am I good enough? And in those questions, we learn a lot about ourselves, but in those hallways, there's also a lot that hurts. You see, I decided to become a public person at a young age. And what does that even mean? I founded an organization when I was in eighth grade. I made headlines. I advocated. I ruffled feathers. I called people out. And people started to talk as they do, right? High school life. Rumors spread quickly. And there are a few resources or recourses to set the record straight. That was hard, because there were nights when I asked myself, is what I'm doing doing anything? Why do they hate me? And it wasn't that everyone hated me, but people oftentimes didn't get me. It's easy to reduce people to a flat perception of what you think they are based on rumors, based on snippets of information that you might have heard about them. And we do it all the time. And that made high school hard often 
because I wanted to engage with people. I wanted to, for people to understand my genuine passion. I wanted to dialogue, but there were few opportunities to do that. So I decided to have these conversations because what better way to set the record straight, to dispel preconceived notions that I have about others, but also theirs about me, than sitting down and asking them questions like, if you could change one thing about the school, what would it be and why? Questions like, what are your greatest hopes and fears for the world? Questions like, what do you look forward to? What are you passionate about? Do you have any questions for me? I had 15 minute conversations with 237 people. And I learned more in those conversations than I could have in many classrooms. But high school is a time when we assume that lectures are the mode of learning. I think we can all agree that that isn't the case. We learn, leaders are born in the uncomfortable. When we dare to question, when we dare to oppose the status quo. So why is it that in high school so often the apathetic student who, pro who propagates and perpetuates problematic ideals is glorified while the student pushing for structural change is vilified? You see, I don't believe in breaking rules. I believe in changing them. And that's why I engaged in this project. I wrote a piece for Teen Vogue at the end, and I submitted a policy paper to my school, putting and amalgamating this information, presenting it, saying, this is what we need to change, this is what the people are feeling. And my most profound lesson that I learned was, if I could do it all over again, identify as an activist first, sure, but I should have talked to everyone and then activated. Because who am I advocating for? The 1530 people that I talk to every day at school? Or am I advocating for the larger community? And if I'm interested in advocating for the broader community, I need to be talking to them. And as I talk to them, I heard from people who just want more conversation, whether it's custodians who want the public announcements to be used more effectively so they can do their jobs more efficiently, or whether it's the kitchen staff who wants the school newspaper to be in, to, given to them so they can be enfranchised in the community. People want to be heard, enfranchised, communicated to. And that's what I learned. People are human. They want to be happy. They want to feel. They want to feel like us. And the way that we feel that is by looking in the eye and talking to them. And I felt that humanity in every person that I talked to, regardless of political ideology. I sat across some people that I knew hated me. Maybe because of my politics, what they heard about me. But it's hard to hate somebody you know. And when you look them across the table and you just see them as that person, they're just a person who wants the same things that you do. And there were certainly moments that I was discouraged. There were moments when I asked people, what do you want to change about the world? And they would say, understanding. They want more people to be understanding. But then I would ask them, do you have any questions for me? And they would say no. And that was a hard juxtaposition to swallow, but I swallowed it because I realized we're all on our own path and I'm not here to judge where we are. I am here to say, let's start somewhere. Because too many students are navigating hallways and feeling unsafe. I talked to black students who felt that in my predominantly white school, they could only feel safe around other black students and I talked to students who never felt safe anywhere. Because we're neglecting key conversations around minority experience, sexual assault, mental health, current events, standard of excellence. How are we expecting to cultivate, to educate leaders of tomorrow, let alone leaders of today, if we aren't talking about today, let alone tomorrow? We are avoiding conversations that are hard, that are difficult, that are uncomfortable. But that's what we need to be having, because how are we expecting Muslim students to go to school and perform at the same level on the field and in a classroom when Muslims are being killed for praying? How are we expecting black students to go into the school and perform on the field and in the classroom when every day they turn on TV and see another black body brutalized? How are we expecting survivors of sexual assault to navigate hallways that are supposed to make them feel safe or they're supposed to learn when we think we've done our job and we mention no means no once, let alone an affirmative consent model of yes means yes. How are we expecting to cultivate leaders of today, let alone tomorrow, if we are taught to know minute details about World War II, but to know nothing about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars that happened during our lifetime? It should not be the case that when my kids ask me, the kids that I hope to one day have, ask me, Daddy, what were those wars like? I should not answer, I don't know. 
We are letting down students, we are letting down each other when we don't demand that we engage in hard conversations, when we don't demand that we are uncomfortable, that we approach these topics with nuance because there is a lack of objectivity, but the way that we feel objectivity, the way that we feel closure, clarity, is by talking to people, learning from experts because the oppressed are the experts on their oppression. So let's hear from them. Let's elevate those voices, let's pass the microphone, let's talk to one another. So I did that 237 times. And I learned so much, and I felt so much humanity. And I was moved, and I was changed, but this is just a starting point. 237 people. It's about how much a small airplane holds. Maybe one that you traveled on to get here today. There are seven billion people in the world, though. That's a lot of people. And this was my first starting point. Because through talking to these 237 people, it changed my life. Through talking to the people in my school. But it doesn't have to be your school. You can start with that person next to you. You can look at them in the eye, you can ask them how they are, you can feel their truth, you can spread that message. You can dismantle us versus them by embracing this idea that we are all us, that we all need to feel us and be us together and thrive together forward and disagree in person and challenge and ask questions and ask hard questions. Because if we're doing that, we can burst our bubbles, we can resist through conversation. Because those people who want us to be divided, who want us to hate one another, to scapegoat one another because it's convenient, because it's easy, because it's expedient, it's easier to count the number of likes on a tweet than it is to quantify the number of hearts and minds changed. But I'm asking you today, Let's change some minds and hearts. Let's get to know some minds and hearts because that's what's beautiful in this world. That's what gets me excited. And I hope it gets you excited too because 237 people changed my life. And I did that. That was my bold move. My bold move was daring to talk to the people in my very hallways, the people who make my space livable, the people that I shared community with for so long but it doesn't have to be your hallway, because that was my bold move. But now, it's your move. Thank you.